Hello, everyone, and welcome to Simon's Book Club, where we'll be discussing some of the best books in psychology, neuroscience, consciousness, mindfulness, relationships, and many ideas that are good for the body. Over the past few weeks, I've been discussing Lisa Feldman Barrett's How Emotions Are Made and talking about some of the major ideas that could really change how we understand emotions altogether. Now, we've undone some of these major myths about emotions. We don't have a lizard brain and then a mammal brain like the triune brain model suggests. That's just not true. And emotions aren't universal. Emotions are culturally taught to us and not all cultures feel the same emotions and some don't even have the concepts of anger or sadness that we have. We can't ever know what emotions other people are feeling without them telling us, since we can't read emotions on other people either. I know, that's, that's a tough one to swallow. But if you think that people scowl when they're angry, well, according to the data, we only scowl about 30% of the time that we're angry. But we also scowl when we're concentrating or when our tummies hurt or when we're trying to follow the plot of a bad TV show, which I can't think of anymore because I, I barely watch any TV. Emotions instead are a combination of three things. The first is our interoceptive sense, what it feels like inside our bodies. That's why emotions feel like something. The second is the situation and the circumstances that we're in. And the third is the emotional word that we were taught to associate with these circumstances. And whenever we feel an emotion, it's our brains making a prediction on what our bodies should feel based on past experiences. And it's giving us different squirts of chemistry like cortisol or oxytocin or glucose or whatever our brain thinks our bodies need at that moment. When we feel this cocktail in our bodies, we apply emotion emotional concepts that we were taught in the situations that we were in as we think that they're similar enough to label similarly. Then we usually get the same behavioral patterns that we're accustomed to, similar trains of thoughts, similar things we say, similar patterns we follow. Now, our interoceptive sense is deeply tied into our body budgets. Basically, our brains act like the finest department of a big company and it allocates resources when needed based on forecasting. We don't react to situations as they happen. Our brains will make a prediction and then it will send us the resources that our bodies need before the situation arises. And that makes sense. If you want to buy a car, for example, it's better to have the money ready as opposed to having to take out a loan and then paying for it later because you have to pay interest on that as well. You know, you don't want to do that. Your body doesn't want to pay interest either. And so your brain is predicting what the body will need beforehand. It's dope sh eh? So this body budget that the brain manages needs to be replenished, which makes sense. You need to replenish your financial budget so that you can continue to pay for rent and groceries. Most of us don't have unlimited funds, so we got to do the things that replenish our bank accounts. And so too it is with the body. We need to replenish the resources that our brains are sending to our bodies. And we do this replenishing, most importantly, through sleep. If we're not sleeping right, our body budgets will be severely depleted. And I think that you could agree with this. Not getting enough sleep feels pretty f***ing brutal. And for me personally, I know that when I'm operating on six hours of sleep or less, then I'm a lot more irritable than I usually am. Now, apart from just sleeping, getting in some rigorous exercise and eating healthily and getting sunlight and connecting with friends and loved ones all also replenish our body budget. That's what Lisa Feldman Bear suggests in the book. And all of that makes sense to me. And, and it made sense to the friends of mine that I've explained this to. I've talked about this with a lot of people. So I, I hope that this makes sense here as well. Where I went next with this idea of the body budget is when things started to get hairy. Not physically hairy, metaphorically. The body didn't get hairy, clearly. Anyhow, this is where my train of thought went. With the idea of a body budget, I kept on thinking about how it seems like we're just replenishing our body budgets and we're just getting it back into balance. It sounds to me almost like we're living paycheck to paycheck and doing what we can to pay back what we've spent. But that's not a way that I wanna live. So I wondered, 
Can I accrue health? Like how people accrue wealth? I wondered, what's it like if we live with a body budget surplus? What's it like if we do all the things that are good for our health? Like if we've worked through all of our childhood traumas through therapy and worked through all of our attachment issues, what's it like being a body budget billionaire? Now, I didn't see the answer to this in the book, so I asked the author directly. The answer was humbling. I'm having a, a little bit of difficulty understanding um, the body budget uh, in some ways. I, I, I know that it's a metaphor and I, I think I might be pushing the metaphor uh, a, a bit far. I'm wondering what would it look like if a body balance is perfectly balanced? If a, if a body budget is perfectly balanced? Is there a possibility in which it's not just that we're making incremental gains back, but can we operate in a body budget surplus rather than a deficit, so to speak? Yeah, so that's a really great question. So first, let me just reiterate what I've said before in print and in conversation, which is that all metaphors are wrong. <laughs> yep, okay. And when you're trying to communicate a complex scientific idea with a metaphor, you choose the metaphor that's least wrong for your purposes. Everything about body budgeting is metaphorical. The actual process we're talking about is a process called allostasis. And allostasis is the process by which your brain anticipates the metabolic needs of your body and um, meets those needs before they arise or just as they arise, right? But usually attempting to do it beforehand because that's what's most metabolically efficient. Mm -hmm. And really what you're trying to optimize here is it metabolic efficiency. You, you shouldn't be thinking about a body budget like uh, a bank account that you can like fill up or uh, draw down on because it, literally it's that's really not what we're talking about. M more or less, we're talking about uh, maybe like uh, an account where things are constantly flowing in and out all the time. Maybe the best way to to just to to explain allostasis, body budgeting is the metaphor for it is um, to compare it to homeostasis, which is the concept that people seem more familiar with, um, which is uh, reactive regulation to a set point. So when it gets, you know, too cold, you um, put on a sweater or you turn up the heat or uh, you move around a lot, you're trying to keep your body temperature within a specific range because if it gets too low or it gets too high, you die. So temperature regulation is more like uh, a thermostat, more like homeostasis. Mm -hmm. But the majority of the brain's regulation of the body is not really around a set point per se. The goal mm -hmm. is not to reach a particular level of surplus. It's more to optimize the efficiency of spending. But I, I think that still some of the metaphor is works really well because um, you can make deposits, you can make withdrawals, you can have savings, like, you know, if somebody else is helping you with a task, if somebody else is even present, who you mm -hmm. trust and who you like, your things will be less expensive, metabolically speaking, and things will be more, uh, will be, uh, more efficient. And if you're stressed in a moment, you know, like, for example, when you eat a meal, if you um, are stressed socially, somebody's around or you read something or you think of something that is going to make uh, metabolism less efficient, it costs you basically the equivalent of 104 calories. It's as if you ate 104 calories more than what you actually ate just in lost efficiency. Really, allostasis, I think the technical definition is trying to find balance in change, which means that you're always, like if your cells are working and you're alive, you're spending resources, right? So your basal metabolic rate, for example, is that's the cost of just keeping your body alive. If you don't do anything, mm -hmm. you don't move, you don't learn anything. You just, that's just, if you're lying still, you know, not, not going anywhere, not doing anything, not thinking about anything, that's the cost of keeping your body alive. So the idea here in body budgeting is that you're attempting to keep things very metabolically efficient. 
Mm-hmm. And the best way to do that is to get enough sleep and to eat healthily and so on and so forth. More importantly, the research that exists on what is helpful to your mood, what is harmful to your mood, what behaviors you can engage in to that will be helpful to your health or harmful to your health. That research I think is pretty solid and is known pretty well and we mm-hmm. can interpret that research in terms of allostasis Mm. but it is useful for people to um, understand what the behavioral evidence means um, Mm. in the absence of that math i suppose you could think about having not so much a surplus but having enough now i'm really glad that i got this answer i definitely see how i took this metaphor in a very misleading directions and it could have got me to the point of obsession to achieve supreme health as i see in some others and i think when i heard the idea of the brain operating as a finest apartment for the body budget my mind went in the direction of hypercapitalism, and it tried to hoard an unnatural and unnecessary amount of resources though not at the expense of everyone else's suffering, as in the regular old capitalist way. So understanding this idea of allostasis, of not so much the financial part of the body budget, but more of the balance part of the body budget, of maintaining consistency in the body, that's vital. That's what needs to be understood. We're not trying to hoard resources. The aim is to balance and to have just enough to handle the challenges as they arise. Especially if we think about the idea of metabolic outlay. I mean, living isn't free. It sure isn't. And our resources aren't unlimited. The more efficiently our metabolism works, then the less we need to spend and the better our bodies will feel. And with that, so too will our mind states be more at ease. So I, I heard you mention uh, a metabolic efficiency. Uh, and like I heard you mention in, in other podcasts as well, the idea of like investing uh, in a way, like you know, going to the gym is a good investment uh, for you and uh, learning uh, more emotional terms is a solid investment in, in that respect as well. Is it because these become more metabolically efficient afterwards when we push ourselves on our windows of tolerance with this or, or how does that work? Would that be similar yeah. there or no? I guess so. I wouldn't quite put it that way, but maybe. I, mm. I guess the way I would say it is the following that think about exercise. Do you exercise? I do. Okay. What do you do? So uh, I do resistance training four times a week and I run and I play basketball. And when you're training for something to get better at it, Mm -hmm. like what, like what have you trained at to get better at it? So I've trained at basketball to get better at basketball and I've trained at weightlifting so I could lift heavier weights and have better form. Yeah. Great. Excellent. And so does it work? Does the practice? Yeah. And do you get faster? at your moves in basketball? Um, well, you... with age, less so. Um, okay, when I was sure, younger. but I just mean with practice. I just mean with practice. Yeah. You know, like yeah. if you want to run faster, you practice that, right? If you mm-hmm. want to, so I also, I do strength training too. And the, there's a certain, you know, what, what trainers will call muscle memory, right? Like you, if you practice something enough, you, you don't have to really concentrate hard. You just snap right into it. And then you can start to lift heavier and heavier and heavier weights, right? With mm-hmm. really good form right? Mm -hmm. Okay. What's happening is your brain is predicting better and better and better each time you do the movement. Every time Mm -hmm. you do the movement, you learn to do it faster and more efficiently. Now, if you're training to compete or to prolong or to lengthen your basketball game or to lift heavier weights or whatever, getting more and more and more efficient at the movements is really good. Mm Because it means that you're not spending as much and you can go for longer or lift heavier weights. But what if you're using exercise for cardiovascular health? That is, you want to, you have to, like when you're running intervals, for example, or Mm -hmm. you're doing anything in intervals, you're trying to get your heart rate up really fast, really high, really fast. And then you want it to come down really fast, right? Because that's adaptable. That just shows that it shows that your your heart, for example, can it can function properly in a range of, of different levels, right? If you practice and practice and practice something, you don't get your heart rate up so fast because you're being more efficient. True. So if you're actually wanting to exercise to um, to keep your the 
flexibility of your heart, um, you know, uh, in tip top shape, or you're attempting to um, lose weight or any of those things, you don't want to practice the same thing over and over and over again. You want to do interval training. Why would you do interval training? You do mm. interval training because you're mixing it up all the time. Mm. And especially if you're a trainer or you're doing interval training and somebody's telling you what to do, like you're watching a video or something, mm. um, then you don't know what's coming next, mm -hmm. which means that it's going to, everything's going to be more expensive because it will be less efficient because your brain couldn't predict. The same thing is true for learning anything. So basically, why would a brain is constantly making predictions and it's predicting motor movements and the sensory consequences of those movements, which, you know, are the become your experiences of the world. And it's always comparing the predictions it makes to the sense data that come from your eyes and your ears and the other sensory surfaces of your body and anything which is any difference between those is called prediction error. Prediction error is a learning signal. Mm -hmm. Your brain will attempt to learn it, but that's expensive. It mm. costs something, literally costs something to learn new material um, because, you know, that requires growing tissue. It requires mm -hmm. protein synthesis and growing tissue. So why would your brain make that investment? Because the idea is that it will let you predict better and faster next time. Mm. And prediction is always better metabolically. It's always more efficient. It always costs you less mm -hmm. than reaction. Mm. Because what you're attempting to do is reduce the uncertainty, which is reducing the metabolic cost. So mm. if you learn something new, you invest the energy to learn something new. The reason for doing that is that at some point it may come in handy, mm -hmm. right? You, mm -hmm. you might be able to predict better in a situation later. You know, so you can think of, of learning, you know, a little bit like training. Lisa Feldman Barrett has a tweet that I've bookmarked and I say it so often that I almost have it memorized. The most expensive tasks that brains do are one, moving your body and two, learning something new. They have a metabolic cost that may feel unpleasant. So feeling bad doesn't always mean that something bad happened. You might just be doing something really hard. That's what she said. The author, I mean, that's what the author said. That is, that is what she said. I hope she approves of this joke. All right, back we go. When we move in new ways or when we think in new ways, then it's going to cost our bodies a lot more resources than if we're already familiar with the movements and the thoughts. This is one of the many reasons why exercise is important. It's not just for aesthetics and vanity and to fit into cultural standards of beauty. More than that, exercise is helpful for how you function throughout your day and makes the movements that you would usually find difficult kind of a lot easier. And it lets you accomplish more in your day more easily so that you don't get gassed or tired or overwhelmed as easily. We expand our windows of tolerance the more we intentionally challenge ourselves, both physically and mentally. So that when we're confronted with situations that we would usually find challenging, we're better prepared to handle them with ease and grace and less suffering. This could also be why people don't really deal with their emotions, but kind of just try to numb them because well shit, there are some times in which we just don't have the resources that we need to process the things that we're experiencing i'm sure we've had moments in which we said or at least want to say look i can't deal with your shit right now or I literally can't even. Older habitual patterns are cheaper on the body budget. I will admit, I didn't handle this interview with as much grace as I would have liked. I was way too excited for this talk and my body definitely felt it. For real, Lisa Feldman Barrett is the smartest person that I've ever spoken with. And no offense to the people that I've ever spoken with, but I've never been in the presence of anyone as dripping with credentials and flush with scientific prestige. I definitely didn't have experience talking with scientists like this before, so I really didn't know what I was doing. 
most of the time I was just smiling and trying to soak it all in, but I was super nervous throughout the conversation. But she handled my shyness and basic questions with both grace and also with strong conviction and overall just a very enjoyable, fun energy. She's great in all the podcast appearances that I've heard in as well. I'm a big fan, if you can't tell by now. Lisa Feldman Barrett is amongst the top 1% of sighted scientists in the world. She's in the top of the field when it comes to neuroscience and emotion and affect, and she's really been important in revolutionizing how we understand our brains, bodies, and emotions. Now, she's written two books. They are How Emotions Are Made and Seven and a Half Lessons on the Brain, and the second one is much shorter and a lot more accessible than the first book. You can go through Seven and a Half Lessons about the brain in probably like a day or so, and then you'll have your whole worldview changed. It's very worth it. In these videos that I'm making about the book, I'm not going to talk about how this new understanding of the brain changes how we understand emotions in animals or how it changes our understanding of the legal system altogether, but she does, and she's very convincing. Check out how emotions are made. It's really time well spent. So back to the interview, we spent a lot of time focused on the body budget and understanding allostasis, but we went in more directions than that. There were also some points that I kind of disagreed with her on, and I still kind of do. So let me know where you stand on this. Okay, here's my thought. The better we take care of our bodies, the more our body budget is balanced, the more we learn healthy patterns through therapy, and the more that we process our childhood traumas and our anxious and avoidant attachment patterns, the less challenging emotions we're gonna feel. This makes sense, right? I mean, life will still throw us challenges. Like, none of us is safe from a challenging life. But I think we could handle those challenges with more ease, the healthier that we are, both physically and mentally. Now here's my question. My question is, does this mean that we could get into a state in which we just don't feel challenging emotions again ever? Is such a healed space possible? Or am I just going through some complicated mental gymnastics to justify emotional avoidance? I don't know, but I kinda believe that this state is possible, that it's on the menu and available to us if we put our energies and efforts towards this kind of healing and peace. And I think it's one of the promises in some of the Buddhist traditions that I've been exposed to. Dr. Feldman Barrett, though, kind of called me out on that as well. I don't actually believe you. I think your behavior no. would be different. Yeah, okay. look, the evidence is... <laughs> now, I'm gonna save that talk for the next video over on my channel, Simon's Book Club. It's, it's a really interesting discussion and one that I'm not fully sold on. Now, we're going to go over the importance of emotional intelligence and especially all hail the circumplex and more. Check it out. Let me know what you think. Thanks for watching.